For Mary Wollstonecraft, as we're going to see, the development of the human person really is conceptualized in terms of our higher faculties. So what a lot of people would call our intellectual on the one hand and our moral faculties on the other hand. The two main terms that she's going to use over and over again are going to be reason, although you'll also see her talking about intellect or understanding and also about knowledge, and virtue. Virtue is probably the term that you're going to see come up more than any of these other things, in part because it's really at the center of it. And virtue also involves a kind of knowledge as well, as we'll, we'll see as we, we get to this. So there are some key questions that are motivating the vindication, questions that she wants to respond to in the affirmative and wants to say that those who have responded to them in the negative have actually been, been wrong and show why they're wrong. So, are women capable of developing virtue? Virtue to the same extent, virtue uh, of the same kinds that, that men are. Or, you know, here's another possibility, are there male virtues and female virtues? Maybe men are supposed to be courageous and, you know, go to war and, and you know, hunt and be the firefighters. And women are supposed to have the domestic virtues, like be, be nice and kind and gentle and nurturing. Um, that's something she's trying to tackle right there. She's going to actually say, women can develop the same virtues that men can. If they haven't, it's because society has been screwed up in keeping them from doing that. Um, there's a sort of self-perpetuating cycle that's been going on, but women are capable of developing every single virtue that a man is, and men should be developing virtues too. The, the, you know, there's, there's a tendency to think that by focusing on women and saying women are capable of this, that somehow that gets anybody off the hook. Women are capable and ought to be developing virtues. Men are capable and ought to be developing virtues. Insofar as they're not, there's something damaged about the human condition in them. Same thing with reason. Are they, fully, are they capable of fully employing reason? Or is there a sort of irrationality that's built into the fabric of womankind, of, of femininity? Again, Wollstonecraft wants to say, no, that's not the case. And, you know, she could point to herself as an example. She doesn't notice that she doesn't make an example of herself in this sort of stuff and say, look, I can do it, so therefore all women can do it. She's making an argument to say that every woman and every man could be fully rational. If they're not, it might be, in some respects, their own fault, but in many respects, it's going to be the fault of the, the society, the institutions, the kind of profession that they're stuck in, and the kind of education or miseducation that it inflicts on them. But these are the questions that she's going to be answering yes to. She's got this great passage at the beginning that I really want to stress here because it gives you a great idea about what she's trying to get at in talking about virtue and reason. So she begins the, the chapter... Um, uh, rights and involved duties of mankind considered, the very first chapter of this work, by saying we need to go back to first principles. We need to rethink what should be going on. So we got to go back to human nature. we got to see what's most fundamental. So she asks, in what does man's preeminence over the brute creation consist? What makes us better than the animals, than stones, than iPhones? Um, you know, they are really part of the brute creation, not, not at her time, but, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, thinking objects. They may be computers. The answer is as clear uh, that it's reason. So our capacity to reason for Wollstonecraft, just as for many other philosophers, is essential to what it means to be a human being. For what acquirement, or she says, what acquirement exalts one being above another? What distinguishes us what makes us actually unequal in a way that's a legitimate inequality? Virtue. Virtue, moral excellence, the bringing to fruition of our human capacities. Then she asks, for what purpose were the passions implanted? And we'll come back to this term passions in just a moment. That man, by struggling with them, might attain a degree of knowledge denied to the brutes, whispers experience. What is, what is she talking about there? Um, well, you know, what is a passion? Fear. We're afraid of something. Do we just run away and, you know, never think about it again? Or do we 
Do we address our fears? Do we develop technology, perhaps, to figure out what's going on? Or if we're afraid of, you know, meteorological phenomena, you know, and we think that maybe it's not the angels bowling, as we were told when we were kids, but the gods actually, you know, wanting to rain boulders down on us or something like that. We develop some, some knowledge, and then we are much better off. We're not afraid of that sort of thing. We can say the same thing about all of our other passions. And this is part of how we develop as human beings in our lives by feeling something and then trying to come to terms with it. We use our minds. And we're going to come back to this passions thing in just a second, like I said. I want to continue with this. She says, the perfection of our nature and the capability of happiness. These are two really important things. Happiness. What will actually make us happy? What will truly satisfy us as human beings? What counts as being fulfilled? She says that that's to, connected with the perfection of our nature. When she says perfection, of course she's meaning this in the old sense, not as in like having a checklist where you, you get everything right or get 100 on the test. That's one kind of perfection, but that's a trivial kind of perfection. Perfection in the sense of developing its capacities all the way. So, you know, we can say that a, a, an acorn that sprouts and grows into an oak tree, even if that oak tree might have some, you know, bad spots on it or it's been attacked by ants, so long as it's actually grown into what it was supposed to grow into, it has reached its perfection. If our nature is to love, then... If we don't love, we have not reached our perfection. No matter how many great test scores we get, no matter how many achievements we pile up. If on the other hand, you know, our, our whole nature is to do well on tests, then I guess that would be the perfection of our nature. But Wollstonecraft doesn't, doesn't think so. She thinks that the perfection of our nature, the fulfillment of what it is to be a human being, the realization of human potential, has to do with virtue, reason, and knowledge. And she gives us a kind of three-part formula to this. She says, uh, the perfection of our nature and capability of happiness must be estimated by the degree of reason, virtue, and knowledge that distinguish the individual, so that exist in an individual, how much reason have you cultivated? Have you really made everything of your mind that you can? Or have you been lazy in that respect? That depends, you know, very much on, on uh, your education and your own efforts, but that determines whether you're going to be happy or whether you're going to be fulfilled. How much virtue have you developed? Do you need to develop more? Do you have vices that you need to start focusing on and, and dealing with? Do you have a bad temper? That might be a virtue uh, or an area of virtue where you need to work on things, you know, with, with respect to mildness. How much knowledge have you acquired? And not just knowledge in the sense of um, a lot of encyclopedic book learning, information. How much practical knowledge have you acquired? And how much of what you take to be knowledge is really knowledge as opposed to fine-spun nonsense that has just worked for a while. How much of your knowledge is based on understanding of first principles, understanding of causes and effects, systematically understanding how things actually work, as opposed to it happen happening to get it right? What Plato actually called the difference between knowledge and right opinion so long ago. We can talk about that as existing in an individual. And insofar as it exists in that individual, that's going to have an influence on how happy that person is. We can also talk about it as directing society. We can look at institutions. We can look at families. We can look at teams. We can look at anything where human beings are associated together and there are some sort of norms. And we can say, how much virtue, how much reason, how much knowledge is actually at work is actually embodied in those, those structures and those groups. If it's just a little bit, you're probably not going to have a lot of happy people. You're probably going to be making people miserable, making them worse as human beings. They're not going to fulfill their human potential. So exploitative relationships, for example, abusive relationships, are probably going to keep us from having any sort of happiness, not only for the exploited or abused person, but even for the exploiter or abuser. In exercise, she says, um, from the exercise of reason, knowledge, and virtue, uh, naturally flow. How much of this is actually being put into effect? That's the interesting thing about these. If you have virtue, 
it's not like you just have a quality that sits there inside of you. You know, here, let's take a, one example, generosity. So you say, I'm a generous person, and you just sit by yourself in your room, and you never interact with anybody else. No, you're not a generous person. You're only a truly generous person if you actually do generous things in relation to other people in the real world. Same thing with reason. She's not talking about a kind of ivory tower, you know, armchair analysis sort of thing. She's talking about engaged reason that allows you to think out your relationships, to think out how you should structure your day, whether you have good work-life balance, all these sorts of things. Are you taking care of your health? Well, that's all a matter of rationality. Same thing with knowledge. Knowledge is not just theoretical. Knowledge is also practical. So insofar as these things exist in these settings, human beings will be led to what they're supposed to be. Insofar as that's not going on, human beings are stunted. Human beings are kept from realizing their true potential, and they are deprived of happiness as a result. They may be able to experience certain pleasures, they may be able to, you know, satisfy certain desires, but that's not the same thing as full-on happiness in a complete sense. So, let's go back to talk about passions. So we mentioned that passions are things that we, we feel, and we can think of them as emotions or drives, uh, responses that we have, affective responses, and it's through struggling with them, struggling with these things that we have because of our human nature, which is also animal nature, that we are able to grow. So, you know, we become courageous, we acquire the virtue of courage by struggling against our fear. It's not that we become courageous by taking a pill that gets rid of all of our fear. That person's not courageous. Or by destroying the, you know, fear center in the brain. That can happen with certain diseases. It's a pretty dangerous life that you live if that's the case, because you don't stay away from things that could kill you. Um, we become courageous by struggling with our passion of fear. We also, if we're at the other extreme, become, you know, courageous as opposed to rash by struggling with our feelings of confidence. Some people are a little bit too cocky because of that. We become temperate by struggling with our desires for pleasures for food, for drink, for sex, for affection, for laying in the sun. We become just by struggling against our natural human passion that steers us towards greed and saying no to it saying, you're not going to run the show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the show, and I'm going to try to do the just thing. If we do that long enough, we will in fact become just, and we will learn things in the process. We will acquire uh, knowledge and develop our rationality. So, you know, she, uh, she goes on and she says that um, we have to struggle with our, our passions. By, by doing so, we begin to, to elevate ourselves. One of the interesting passions that she's going to talk about, and I'm going to talk more about this in another video, is the passion of love, the passion of attraction, of infatuation, of sexual desire that seeks some sort of connection, not just a sexual connection, but something else with the other person. What we do with that has a huge effect on the kind of human beings that we become and whether we're going to be happy or whether we're not going to be happy. So, um, let's go on. Yeah, she says the passions should unfold our, our reason, which is a nice way to talk about it. So, let's now look at what she has to say about virtue. I'm not going to talk so much about rationality, because we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the section, or in the video on education. But I want to talk about virtue itself. So when we talk about virtue, first off, we can say virtue in the singular, and then we mean all the virtues, or we mean a virtue. Or we can talk about virtues in the plural. And then we're talking about character traits like generosity, like even temper, like honesty, like perseverance, these sorts of things. And... Here's a few key points about virtue that Wollstonecraft is making in this. 
One is virtues can't really be developed in a state of dependency. You can develop what she's calling at certain points the minor virtues, which actually turn out to just be a matter of manners rather than of morality you know, being nice to people. You can become a nice person in a state of dependency. You can't become a good person, a fundamentally good person in a state of dependency. Why not? Well, there's two reasons that she talks about. And some of the passages that she says are, are particularly good. Um, Here we go. She says, women are not allowed to have sufficient strength of mind to acquire what really deserves the name of virtue. But it would seem that if they, if they have human nature, there's only one way for them to acquire happiness, and that's through virtue. Now, what are they told instead? That they should be in a state of dependency, she says. Um, if, women, if it were allowed that women were destined by providence to acquire human virtues and by the exercise of their understandings, that stability of character, which is the firmest ground to rest our future hopes upon, they must be permitted to turn to the fountain of light and not forced to shape their course by the twinkling of a mere satellite. If you can't decide for yourself, I want to actually do the right thing, not because somebody's telling you or forcing you, or coercing you, forcing your hand, but because you want to do that, you want to make something of yourself, you can't really acquire virtue, is what Wollstonecraft is saying. So she's got this metaphor of, you know, we should, we should be permitted to turn to the fountain of light and not forced to shape our course by the twinkling of a mere satellite. What would the mere satellite be in that case? A man. A man who's you know, the stand-in for, for what counts as virtue. And she goes on at another point, and she talks about um, Rousseau. Rousseau has this, this idea that women should always be dependent upon men. She says, um, to reason on Rousseau's ground, if man did attain a degree of perfection of mind when his body arrived at maturity, it might be proper, in order to make a man and his wife one, that she should rely entirely on his understanding and the graceful ivy clasping the oak that supported it would form a hole in which strength and beauty would be equally conspicuous. So, you know, the idea, the, the, the ivy, by the way, is kind of a parasitic plant. Um, the ivy grows up on the oak. The ivy can't grow on its own. It needs the structure that the oak provides. The oak is the man. The ivy is the woman. And Wollstonecraft says, that's nonsense. That's not going to work. Why? Well, a hell of a lot of men aren't oaks. A lot of them are ivies themselves. They're incapable of displaying genuine virtue because they haven't developed it themselves. They're in, you know, insufficient to the task. If you want to say that women should be kept in a state of dependency so that their moral development would be, uh, you know, in some way guided by their, their superiors, then that has to be a superior. So unless you've got a whole bunch of other men in mind, uh, than the ones that we typically <laughs> encounter, uh, Wollstonecraft is saying, this is not going to work. You're actually going to be making women worse off than if they'd relied on their, their own understanding. At least then they'd make their own stupid mistakes instead of following along with the stupid mistakes of their husbands or brothers or, or fathers. There's another problem, though, that this leaves you in immaturity. If you don't develop things on your own, because you yourself identify with it at some point, not in childhood, but in adulthood, you remain in a state of immaturity that's not compatible with genuine virtue. So, you know, for example, so long as, I'll give you an example actually from my own past. I remember when I was in the army and I did training, um, I have a fear of falling, I have a fear of heights, and I was able to repel um, on three occasions you know, rappelling is where you jump off and you got a rope and you slide down and, you know, it's kind of, kind of cool looking. Um, and it's something that you might have to do in, in real battlefield situations, um, depending on, you know, what's going on. 
And I was able to do it when I had a drill sergeant telling me, if you don't get off of here, I'm going to throw you off. I was able to deal with the fear. And then I remember getting out of the Army and hanging out with a friend of mine who didn't have a fear of heights. And he was like, hey, let's go rappel off that railroad bridge right there, which was only about like 30 feet up compared to like doing 120 feet before that in the Army. And I found myself unable to actually do it. For half an hour, I sat there with the rope, you know, you hold the rope behind your back and you've got the whole harness on and I would push off and swing and my hand would clench up and I couldn't let go. And I tried visualization, I tried, you know, breathing, I tried thinking my way through it. My friend was very nice, he didn't like, you know, um, make fun of me or anything. Then again, perhaps if he'd made fun of me, like, you know, or said something like the drill sergeant, maybe I would have been able to do it. I wasn't able to do the task on my own. If you develop the things that you develop only in a state of dependency, then when what you're dependent on is gone, you will not be able to perform. Or if you are, it'll be blind luck. So if women are supposed to acquire virtues, they need to be able to acquire virtues out of the context of dependency. How are, we how are we going to develop virtues? We're going to develop them through what Wollstonecraft calls education. And she understands this to mean something quite broad. Um, it's more than just you know, formal education. It's all the things that influence the development of our minds and our character. And we can develop virtues or develop vices or not develop either through the influence of education. And education can be good or bad. So we have to pay close attention to that. And if women are deprived of any sort of systematic education, that means that they're probably going to be deprived of the virtues as well. Wollstonecraft at many points stresses that virtue can't be something that's separated out into womenly virtue and male virtue. That doesn't work in her view. She calls that sexual virtue, and she says, I'm combating that whole idea. Why? Because if it's going to be virtue, if it's going to be human excellence, if it's going to be what actually brings us to happiness and what perfects our human nature, men and women have the same fundamental human nature. They have different genders, but they don't have a different human nature. Women are not a different species from men. They're a different sex or gender, from men, but they're not a different species, and so the perfectioning of, of women's nature is the same as the perfectioning of men's nature. There's one standard of virtues for both men and women. She says, um, I see not the shadow of a reason to conclude that their virtues should differ in respect of their nature. In fact, how can they if virtue has only one eternal standard? If we want to say that virtue actually means anything, and along with it, if we want to say that moral distinctions, like good and bad, right and wrong, actually mean something substantive, we have to have standards that go across the board. Probably standards, by the way, that most of us are not going to measure up to all that well, if we you know, look at what, what Wollstonecraft is advising. Now, she's willing to say that it could be the case that... Um, Men are able to develop virtues to a greater degree, but they're not virtues of a different kind. And she's putting that in there, not because she actually believes in it, but just to address the possibility. She clearly doesn't believe that men uh, are the ones who are able to, able to develop courage to the greatest extent, or fortitude or perseverance to the greatest extent, or justice, or any of those sorts of things. But she is willing to say that virtues can vary in degree, and we, we in fact do see that virtues do vary in degree. Not everybody is as just, or not everybody is as temperate as everybody else. Um, she also says something else that's very interesting, and she talks about the possibility of sacrificing virtue for other things. What would it be sacrificed for? What are the other possibilities? At one point, she talks about sacrificing virtue to present convenience. She says, there can only be one rule of right if morality has an eternal foundation. Whoever sacrifices virtue to present convenience 
or whose duty it is to act in such a manner, lives only for the passing day and cannot be an accountable creature. So if we're forced to subordinate the virtues and our development of them, which is what's really key to us as human beings, to present convenience, to staying out of trouble, to you know, getting what we want out of people, we're not going to develop as human beings. And that holds just as much for men as it does for women. In the case of women, what is the present convenience? That state of dependency. Uh, being treated as objects of attraction and being given a limited amount of power, but also being ruled over by, by men for the sake of, say, security. 